Um, so uh, um, uh, I'm I'm very excited to um, uh, well I'm not sure if restarting is the the right word uh, since we never really stopped, but uh, still there's been uh, quite some time uh, till the last time we had a Kuva so Qualcomm Kuva Deep Vision seminar. Uh, because of the pandemic. Anyways, um, uh, we're very excited to, to have um, uh, have this organized once more, this time uh, uh, online. Uh, unfortunately, not um, uh, physically. Uh, we're very happy to have uh, uh, Mark, Mark van der Vilk, um, present to us uh, uh, this time on uh, Bayesian model selection uh, and uh, in deep learning. So Mark is with uh, Imperial College London. And um, uh, he's a lecturer there in the Department of Computing. He's currently interested in uh, automating inductive bias, uh, uh, selection neural networks and making them less reliant on human design. Uh, Mark really loves uh, Occam's razor and its effect uh, <laughs> on uh, Bayesian inference. And um, he believes in that uh, it can be part of the solution. And in addition, he works on trying to make, work, uh, make it work in deep learning. Uh, especially with Bayesian techniques uh, in areas where they work very well, for instance, low data. Uh, he works uh, extensively with industry partners, and uh, in the long term, he's interested in developing flexible neural networks that adapt their structure to minimize computational cost, as well as improving their generalization performance. So I'm going to uh, uh, clap, and you can multiply it by 100. <laughs> um, for this, for the honor, thank you very much again, and I suggest uh, you know you start whenever uh, you are ready. All right, perfect. Well, um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, firstly, thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's uh, uh, nice to be able to talk to Qualcomm. Um, I've been uh, Qualcomm has kind of been on my radar for a long time uh, because uh, uh, the Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship actually helped me out in the last part of my PhD. So uh, it's nice to be able to uh, chat into all of you. Uh, at Qualcomm once again. Um, so yeah, um, today I essentially want to talk about uh, some recent work that I've done that all fits together in this theme of uh, Bayesian model selection. And uh, yeah, like, uh, like Stratus said, um, Occam's razor is the thing that I kind of love most about uh, Bayesian inference, and in which I think is kind of the most interesting effect that you get from Bayesian inference. And um, uh, Occam's razor is also the main mechanism by which Bayesian uh, model selection uh, works. So uh, it's, um, yeah, given the fact that I think that this is really interesting, I'm, I'm happy that I can actually uh, do some research into it. And um, I also think it addresses an important problem of model selection, which is only going to be, uh, yeah, a more important problem going into the future in deep learning, I think. And um, hopefully, I think if we can solve the problem of Bayesian uh, inference of, on the weights of deep neural networks, then um, we can get all the benefits from Bayesian model selection in deep learning as well. So um, that's roughly what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'll, um, uh, and I'll be talking about three different strands uh, that have recently been uh, following up on that all kind of broadly center around this goal. Um, I'm completely happy to take questions uh, throughout the talk. So if you, uh, if anything's unclear or you want some more uh, background, then uh, please do speak up. I would uh, be completely happy to uh, take a little tangent here and there. So um, yes, uh, outline of the talk. So the, the goal that all of these strands of work um, are moving towards uh, is towards automatic model selection in deep learning. So um, I'm going to, uh, split this talk into roughly three parts. So firstly, I want to talk about the promises of Bayesian model selection. And I want to show some interesting examples of uh, work that I've done uh, yeah, quite a while ago in 2018 already, um, which motivates uh, what, we might, what kind of features of Bayesian model selection we might want to get in deep learning. So the examples that I'll be showing are um, uh, examples of model selection in shallow models, specifically Gaussian processes. Um, but I think they illustrate uh, nicely the kind of things that we would want to do in deep learning. The next uh, two parts, we'll be talking about uh, some attempts um, and some issues with trying to get uh, this to actually work in deep learning. So um, 
I want to talk in the second part of the talk. I want to talk about why um, these uh, why Bayesian model selection is currently still not possible in in deep learning, and what kind of problems we need to solve in order to um, in order to get there. And then finally, I want to talk about um, a maybe slightly different approach to the first two parts, uh, which is more practical and relevant and usable at large scale today. Uh, but there are connections and uh, the paper that I will be talking about is inspired uh, by ideas from Bayesian model selection. So it all centers around uh, the same theme and we're essentially going from kind of the idealistic notion of uh, how things could work to the difficulties of making it work to um, an example where we just do some empirical things and get something that does work. Right, so um, just a brief overview of model selection and uh, what it is and why it's important. So every single time we train a neural network, we need to decide, we need to make many decisions of how to adjust uh, the neural network model. Uh, so there are many hyperparameters which we pick, right? For example, we have um, the choice of how many layers we have in a neural network, how many units we have in a particular layer, what structure do we use in a particular layer? Do we, do we use a convolutional layer? Do we have skip connections? Um, is it fully connected? Do we do group convolutions? These are all choices that we have to make. Um, and uh, for example, we also have uh, uh, things like data augmentation parameters, which uh, also influence how our model generalizes. So all of these choices that we make essentially change the inductive bias that our neural network has. And um, the inductive bias that our neural network has is incredibly important uh, for determining how the model will perform in practice. So most of the um, improvements in performance that roughly happened between maybe 2006 and 2016 or 18 or something like that, were all um, essentially um, consequences of people becoming better at training neural networks and choosing better and bigger architectures. Um, and uh, currently this is a manual process, which uh, is very labor intensive. So um, the issue with um, architecture search, I think is only going to get more complicated in the future uh, because architectures are getting more complex and the design uh, of uh, architectures is therefore also going to get more complex. So uh, one uh, example that I, that I really like is uh, comes from um, the, uh, the talk in the, um, in the autonomous driving workshop at ICML 2019 by Karpathy, um, which is where he showed an architecture which was incredibly large and um, multitask. And uh, the number of design decisions that were required in order to uh, train that network grew even larger than for a normal network uh, that you train on say one data set like CIFAR. So there were questions like, which layers should you share between tasks? Different tasks might need to branch off uh, the network at a different point. Um, how many, what's the architecture of your task specific layers, right? So for every single task, you have a few task specific layers and those need to be adjusted as well. And then also the question of how much uh, capacity, like how many parameters roughly should we assign to every single task in order to get a um, overall globally good performance. So um, I think that there is some reason to believe that in the architectures of the future, uh, these are going to be uh, more and more um, kind of multitask architectures that uh, do things like meta learning and um, all of these uh, architectures will uh, need to be designed as well and doing so by hand by trial and error is probably not the best way to go into the future. Um, yeah, so currently the main way that this is done is uh, uh, essentially hand designing architectures and using cross validation to select the right architecture. So you train an architecture see how well it performs on a test set and then pick the best one. So the goal of um, my research is essentially um, to remove this, uh, uh, this kind of difficult manual procedure of choosing the architecture. And ideally I would like to make it as easy as learning network weights. Um, so you give it an objective function and you just maximize that objective function and you end up with something that performs well. Uh, so that is where I would like to go to. So um, 
to give an idea of how this uh, uh, utopian vision could look, um, we can see how this works in uh, a model where you can actually do this selection of inductive bias through uh, uh, gradient descent. And such a model is a Gaussian process. Um, and specifically, we're going to use Bayesian inference uh, as a unifying way to uh, learn the parameters of a model as well as uh, to learn the architecture uh, of the model or the inductive bias. So um, to start, I just want to um, highlight how architecture selection or inductive bias selection uh, is done um, within the Bayesian framework. So I'm going to consider a supervised learning problem similar to the ones that we uh, know well in deep learning where we've got uh, for example, images uh, coming in, and uh, we pass them through some kind of function approximator, which in a neural network uh, is uh, a neural network parameterized by some weights. Uh, but we're just going to think about it in terms of uh, trying to learn some kind of function that maps from your inputs to your outputs. Um, and um, essentially, from the Bayesian point of view, uh, what you do is you represent uh, your prior over functions. Um, which represents your inductive bias. And then in order to make predictions, you essentially find your uh, posterior distribution given your observed data. Now, um, essentially, architectural choices in neural networks uh, influence the prior on functions. And uh, these architectural choices, choices can be uh, represented by hyperparameters. Um, and uh, from a Bayesian point of view, these hyperparameters are essentially just another unknown that you can uh, infer using Bayes rule. So um, this is a little bit neglected, I think, in the Bayesian deep learning community, which focuses mostly on trying to do, use Bayes rule to um, get some uncertainty uh, in the function um, so that you can make uh, robust predictions. Now, this is important, uh, but Bayes rule also tells us that we can use the same principle to find these, uh, these hyperparameters theta. Um, so uh, specifically in this part of the talk, what kind of uh, architectural hyperparameters are, are we going to talk about? Well, um, what's interesting is that in Gaussian processes, it turns out that you can express uh, interesting different inductive biases in your prior. Uh, for example, inductive biases like uh, invariance. And um, essentially, in the work that I'm going to be talking about, uh, we use this Bayesian approach to uh, learn uh, what the right invariance is in order to generalize well on a particular class of problems. So to give a little toy example here, um, I've got a bunch of uh, weights. You can think about learning the function either in weight space or function space. It's, it's equivalent. Um, and then here, I've got two different actual um, two-dimensional functions uh, that correspond to those same weights. So here I've got a convolutional or an invariant architecture, uh, which you can see uh, is uh, invariant to flipping the, uh, the two inputs. So everything on this side of the line is the same on this side of the line. And we also have a fully connected architecture, which we can parameterize with the same weights, but we get a different function. So the point is, is that um, we, uh, the architectural decisions determine the, uh, how the weights relate uh, to uh, the distribution of functions. And we're interested in finding the functions uh, based on data as well as uh, what the right architectural choice is. Um, so uh, yeah, and we can show that if we have different uh, weights, we get different functions and uh, we want to infer both from the data. Um, so that is the problem setting. So uh, like I said, um, Bayesian inference tells us what we should do. Um, and the answer is, let's just find the posterior over all our unknowns. So where Bayesian deep learning currently focuses mostly on trying to find a posterior over the function values, um, we can also ask for the posterior over the function values and the hyperparameters, the architectural, uh, the architectural parameters, which in our case determine the invariance. And all that requires is that you um, uh, place, is that you parameterize your prior over functions with your uh, architectural choices and then place a prior of your architectural choices. So um, let's follow this through a little bit and see what uh, Bayesian inference tells us to do. 
Well, it turns out that this posterior has some simplifying structure in it. And um, it, if you uh, do this decomposition, you can see that um, finding the posterior over both the architectural choices and the function uh, can be split up into simply finding the posterior over the function, um, as well as a hyper posterior, uh, which tells us your belief over what the right uh, architectural choices uh, should be made. So this is essentially the posterior over architectural choices over hyperparameters, p of theta given y the data. Um, so this essentially splits up the problem into two parts. The part that uh, Bayesian deep learning already focuses on and a new part uh, to find the posterior over these architectural choices. Now, the crucial thing uh, that we see is that in order to find this uh, posterior over hyperparameters, we need the marginal likelihood. So the marginal likelihood is the normalizing constant of the usual posterior. And that then turns into the likelihood uh, for inference over the hyperparameters. Um, so this decomposition is nice because it means that uh, for estimating the function, you can just do the usual thing. Um, and um, for the estimation of the hyperparameters, uh, we just need to estimate this quantity, uh, the marginal likelihood. Now I say just need to estimate this quantity. This is the key problem that prevents us from uh, applying this um, in, uh, at scale. So estimating this quantity is the challenge, but if we could estimate this quantity, then uh, we could do all kinds of cool stuff. So um, one other simplification uh, that is often made is that we don't look at entire posterior um, over uh, hyperparameters because this brings a large cost with it and often not much benefit because you would have to keep track of multiple architectures uh, at one time. Uh, so what uh, we often do is we often use a point estimate of the uh, model by simply maximizing the marginal likelihood. Uh, so this is called ML2 and it's been investigated in the st statistics literature uh, for a long time. Now, um, the great thing is, is that uh, the, um, uh, what this tells us, what Bayesian inference essentially tell, tells us is that we've got an objective function for which we can choose our hyperparameters. Um, and we can, uh, we can optimize this, uh, uh, this objective function with gradients if we have them. And this is a super convenient way uh, to fit parameters because we already use gradients in order to fit the many parameters in a neural network. Wouldn't it be great if we could use um, gradient descent to uh, find inductive bias parameters as well? So essentially by following this Bayesian reasoning through, we get a, um, we get a uh, objective function that we can just optimize. Now, one thing to note is that this objective function is not the, um, like the, the model fit of your parameters, right? It's, that's the likelihood. That's how well your, your function actually fits all your data. Uh, the marginal likelihood uh, tells you, um, well, there are many different interpretations for it, but um, it essentially automatically includes uh, a kind of uh, Occam's razor effect that prefers simpler models. So to a certain extent, it's protected from overfitting. Um, I can talk more about why the marginal likelihood doesn't overfit at the end of the talk, uh, if um, anybody is interested. But for now, um, I, uh, I hope that either is, everybody is either familiar with this and on the same page or uh, is happy to believe me uh, for the time being. So uh, long story short, we want to maximize the marginal likelihood with respect to the hyperparameters to find uh, our architectural choices under inductive bias. Uh, and this is super convenient if we can at least compute this uh, quantity. Now, uh, the problem with Bayesian inference is that it often tells us what to do, but it doesn't tell us how to do it. And um, computing these quantities is, uh, is challenging because uh, the marginal likelihood requires doing an integral um, for which there is often no closed form solution. Now, variational inference actually um, is a method by which you can approximate Bayesian quantities. Um, so, variational inf where Bayesian tells us what Bayesian inference tells us what to do, but not how to do it. Variational inference tells us actually how to do it. Um, and variational inference essentially gives us two things. It gives us an approximate posterior. So that's what Bayesian deep learning usually uh, uh, tries to. Uh, approximate. 
So uh, that just gives you your uncertainty over your weights or your functional mapping. But it also gives you an estimate of the marginal likelihood. Particularly, that's what this evidence lower bound is. Um, and what's interesting is that the quality of the estimate of the marginal likelihood is related to the quality of your estimate of your posterior. So the better your approximate posterior is in terms of KL divergence, the closer your marginal likelihood is to the true marginal likelihood. So um, this essentially uh, argues for a particular procedure um, for finding the posterior and the hyperparameters, which is by simultaneously maximizing uh, your elbow with respect to your variational parameters, which makes this gap smaller, and the hyperparameters, which um, tries to maximize the, uh, the marginal likelihood. So the variational uh, approach essentially gives us a, a nice uh, objective function, an approximate objective function, by which we can approximately um, maximize the uh, marginal likelihood. And as long as we do inference correctly, so as long as we estimate our uncertainties correctly, then this KL divergence will be small and will be close to maximizing the marginal likelihood, which is what we set out to do. Um, right, so this is the uh, procedure by which um, we will find invariances in um, gas and process models. So, um, yeah, so what we're going to be wanting uh, to do, the problem that we're going to look at um, is we've got um, uh, a particular function approximator, our Gaussian process, um, that determines uh, our uh, prior and posterior over, um, uh, over functions, which allows us to make predictions. And our goal is to approximate both the uh, approximate posterior over functions so that we can make predictions and find these hyperparameters, which determine the inductive bias of the, um, uh, of the Gaussian process. And the inductive bias is super important for uh, predicting well, so, um, uh, and different inductive biases are appropriate for different data sets. So specifically, what we're the kind of uh, example that we're going to take is we're going to look at uh, MNIST and rotated MNIST. And we want to train a single model on both data sets. And we want, to, uh, we want to find a method that automatically adapts to the rotational invariance that rotated MNIST has um, while not uh, uh, while adding different invariances, maybe smaller invariances that are uh, invariance to local deformations that help um, on the classification of the normal MNIST task. So um, we're going to find a single procedure for that. Um, and uh, we're going to find the appropriate prior for each task by um, essentially optimizing this elbow with respect to the hyperparameters that correspond to different invariances. So what are the ingredients that we need for uh, solving this problem? Well, um, the first thing we need is we need to, a way to constrain the learnable functions uh, that, we, that we have in our prior to be invariant. Um, so if we consider the set of all functions, then uh, we can uh, imagine uh, sets of functions which are all translation invariant and which are all rotation invariant. And, um, the goal that we want to do is we want to uh, firstly find a function within one of these sets, right? So that's normal uh, learning of the posterior over functions. But then secondly, we want to consider which inductive bias we actually want, right? So that tells us which one of these sets we should pick our function from. Uh, so the first thing we need is a way to actually uh, construct priors on functions uh, that are constrained to be invariant. The second ingredient we need is we need a way to parameterize different sets of invariant functions, right? So we need a way to parameterize uh, a prior over functions, which has a particular invariance property and a different prior over functions, which has a different invariance uh, property. And then the problem, um, uh, the problem reduces to finding a posterior over these functions and then also finding uh, the hyperparameters, which determine which of these sets of functions we choose, the fun uh, we choose our regressor from. And then finally, um, yeah, one other detail, by the way, is that we need to parameterize these sets of invariances or these invariances differentially, right? And we do this differ differentially so that we can use gradients to find which invariance we need. So we need to be able to interpolate smoothly between uh, different invariances. 
And then finally, we need an objective function um, for learning both the function um, and the invariance um, that we can back propagate through. So that's the variational lower bound that we discussed a second ago. So um, essentially, uh, we've, uh, we discussed in principle what this uh, objective function is, that's this elbow. And as long as we have a differentiable procedure that's differentiable all the way from, the <clears throat> uh, from defining the loss through um, learning the, uh, the function, the regressor, through selecting the uh, set of invariances all the way to the uh, parameters that parameterize the invariance, then we can learn all of this through gradients. And that's what we can do. So how do we parameterize um, invariant functions? Um, that is the first ingredient. Well, convolutions are one way to do this. And um, uh, what's neat is that um, you can take non-invariant functions and turn them into invariant functions, essentially by convolving them uh, over inputs which are transformed in a particular way. So um, strict invariance, for example, you can get by uh, summing over an orbit of a group that describes that invariance. Um, now, what we do is we, um, okay, so orbits are kind of, and, and groups are kind of discrete, discrete structures. And it's difficult to, or at least I certainly haven't really seen a way to do this, to continuously parameterize groups of different invariances and interpolate between them. Uh, and that essentially comes from the fact that uh, groups have very specific strong uh, requirements on their mathematical structure. So um, what we end up doing is we say, well, we're going to relax this a little bit and um, integrate a non-invariant function over uh, a set of transformations um, and then predict with the average uh, over this set of transformations over which we put a distribution. So this is an invariant. So th the invariance that we talk about is more akin to data augmentation, right? Where you essentially pass many different uh, examples of your transformed image through your uh, uh, through your function, and then um, uh, predict with the average of that. Now this averaging procedure. Uh, essentially, um, it reduces the, or it constrains the output of the function to be similar for inputs that have similar transformed images. And in the extreme case where the set of transformed images is the same for two different inputs, you end up back in the strict invariance case where you're summing over the same points and you're summing over an orbit. So the strict invariants are kind of strictly um, the extreme points of what we can parameterize. Now, um, given this recipe for turning a uh, non-invariant function into an invariant function, uh, we can parameterize our non-invariant function and then just learn that. Uh, so that's what we do. And uh, we do it e either with a Gaussian process or a single layer uh, neural network. The two are equivalent, essentially. And if we place a prior on this, uh, on this function g, that implies a prior on the function f. And the relationship is deterministic, so it doesn't matter which um, view we actually do inference in. Um, now, in the paper, uh, I'll give a reference to that in a bit. We uh, derive an elbow uh, for this, so a marginal likelihood approximation for this. And I don't want to go into the details uh, in this particular talk, just uh, to keep it high level. Um, but essentially what we end up with is a, a training procedure where we generate a sample of transformed images um, from a differentiable uh, distribution of transformations so that we can differentiate through it using the reparameterization trick. And then we get this set of, uh, uh, set of transformed images. Then we estimate our invariant function um, by uh, uh, by taking the average over the output of all the non-invariant uh, functions. So this essentially, um, this is uh, essentially subsampling the convolution and uh, then summing over all the conv uh, convolved outputs, but we're uh, taking a unbiased estimate because um, uh, our orbits can be infinitely large. So that's the best that we can do. And then using a few unbiasing tricks, we can compute an unbiased estimate uh, an unbiased stochastic estimate of the elbow um, using a Monte Carlo estimate of, uh, of f of x. 
and then we back propagate to get the gradients. Um, and essentially, so yeah, so I've got a little um, a little uh, schematic here. We've got our inputs uh, x here. Uh, we pass them through tra through transformation. The transformation uh, comes uh, is a random transformation that is uh, sampled from a reparameterizable uh, distribution, so that we can back propagate uh, through the parameters of this distribution over the transformations. We take the average to estimate our invariant function. We pass that to something that computes the elbow, um, and then we compute our loss on the training data. And then the idea is that we back propagate through the uh, invariance parameters as well as through the variational parameters. So we represent uh, uncertainty about our function, that's our, our variational parameters, but we find a point estimate over the hyperparameters. Now, um, essentially, this was. Um, uh, this this procedure um, leads to a very nice procedure for picking your invariants, right? All you need to do is parameterize a class of transformations that you might want to be invariant to, and then you can simply use back propagation uh, to pick uh, to pick which uh, one was the right one. So we could apply the same architecture, the same overall um, uh, overall uh, procedure to the rotated MNIST datasets and learn to be invariant to rotations and to the MNIST data sets and uh, learn to be invariant to um, only small uh, rotations and scales and skews, which looked a lot more like the data augmentations that people applied in practice. So, um, so far what I've described is a, uh, is a single layer approach. Uh, and that's what we did in our 2018 paper, learning invariances using the marginal likelihood. Since then, we've been working on scaling this up to uh, deeper architectures. So I've been doing this in collaboration with Paula Schwebel and Martin Jurgensen uh, from DTU. And um, essentially, the approach that we took was to um, essentially use an architecture where we use an invariant Gaussian process at the last layer, and uh, then a deep uh, neural network which is, extracts features from the input images uh, before feeding it to the uh, to the neural network. So it's a little bit of a shortcut, but we still get a marginal likelihood over the last layer. And uh, since that's where the summation happens over these uh, um, uh, over the data augmentation, over the invariance that we want to learn, um, we still have the same procedure that I described earlier for the single layer case, and we can still back propagate um, the invariance parameters uh, all the way to the inputs where the transformations are applied. Uh, so this is still quite preliminary work. We're still uh, scaling it up onto more complicated data sets. But on MNIST, um, doing so allowed us to become, uh, allowed us to learn invariances, uh, which made us far more data efficient in the uh, low data regime. So essentially here we've got a comparison for different uh, sizes of the training set where um, we uh, compare a convolutional neural network um, and then a convolutional ne ne neural network with a Gaussian process on top, which makes, makes us slightly more um, uh, data efficient. And then a Gaussian process, um, uh, which also learns uh, the correct invariance. Uh, and we see that we become even more uh, data efficient. And the neat thing here is that um, uh, we did not need any architectural changes in order to get this, uh, uh, this improvement in performance. We simply learned uh, from a, a set of uh, parameterized uh, transformations uh, that describe different invariances, which one was appropriate to improve the performance through backprop. And we've got a similar result for rotated MNIST. So it automatically learns to pick the invariance which is appropriate for the right data set. So um, next steps on this particular line of work. Well. Um, there are some downsides to this approach. Um, even though we managed to find the invariance, the, the training procedure is slightly difficult. So it requires doing coordinate ascent. So it's a unified objective function, uh, but we have to switch between training the parameters of the neural network versus the invariance parameters. Uh, this is a bit cumbersome and it would be nice to not have to do this. Um, so uh, one thing that we're working on is uh, better objective functions um, that essentially allow us to train all the parameters jointly. The other downside of what we're doing is that we're essentially learning an invariance for the entire network from start to finish. Now, 
so this is what's done with data augmentation, but um, maybe a more successful way of uh, incorporating invariances into large neural network networks is by um, uh, in, in, in embedding the, uh, them as an equivariant structure in a layer itself. So I'm sure some of you here in uh, this group uh, have thought a lot about this. And um, yeah, it would be nice to uh, parameterize the invariances in such a way where we could uh, automatically figure out what the right equivariance is for a particular intermediate layer, rather than um, learning the invariance as this kind of end-to-end -end process that's kind of t tacked on top of the uh, procedure. Um, yeah, so those are the, I, I'll keep it at that for the uh, time being as, as next steps. Um, so essentially the solution that we described a second ago um, was this, uh, mer relied on merging this method that works on shallow learning um, and tacked it on top of a, uh, uh, of a neural network and allows, allowed us to get some of the benefits of both. But um, what's preventing us from actually applying these principles in um, actual deep neural networks uh, and doing something like, for example, learning the uh, invariance for every layer simultaneously? So what are the difficulties, difficulties that we're facing? So just to make the contrast clear, um, the only Bayesian inference that we did in this example was on the top, uh, on the top layer. And in order to um, do the invariance learning for, for example, uh, uh, layer by layer, we would have to do Bayesian inference and get a marginal likelihood for the entire neural network. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a hack that only uh, does it at the top layer. So what is preventing us from uh, doing Bayesian inference in uh, kind of uh, as a whole in, in large scale neural networks? So people have tried to apply these variational approaches to uh, deep neural networks before. And uh, one nice example of this is uh, uh, Charles Blundell's paper in 2015, um, where they simply tried to approximate the posterior or the weights of the neural network. Um, using a variational bound and uh, a, a different uh, mean field, um, so an independent weight over every single, an independent distribution over every single weight in the neural network. Um, and so uh, this approach has been um, broadly successful to get at least some kind of uncertainty estimates out of your neural, uh, out of a neural network, but nobody has really been able to use the elbow as an approximation to the marginal likelihood yet. And um, uh, so in the Blundell paper, they actually comment on this and they say that empirically, we found that optimizing the parameters of a prior, so that's what we did in the previous section by taking derivatives of the elbow to not be useful and yield worse results. So something is stopping us from doing inference over all the weights in a neural network and then using the resulting elbow to um, maximize the, uh, to, to find the inductive bias implied by particular priors. Um, and from some, um, from my own experiments, um, I've observed that one common failure mode is that the um, elbow prefers a very simple model, which uh, actually switches off the neural network and just does random guessing uh, to a model that actually fits the data and predicts well. So, um, yeah, so, and I actually see that the elbow that you get for this model that uh, just randomly guesses is often much larger than the elbow that you get um, for a sensible prior. Now, this is a real problem. And um, one um, uh, possible, uh, one possible explanation for this is that the KL divergence um, of our approximate posterior to the uh, true posterior is just too large. And that means that the, um, that the elbow is going to be too loose. So even though the true marginal likelihood is, is much larger for the sensible model, um, um, the gap uh, caused by this KL in our lower bound causes the lower bound to become vacuous and uh, not helpful to optimize. So this is one hypothesis as to why we currently can't do this in deep neural networks. Um, 
so that would imply that we would need to uh, improve the um, uh, the inference schemes in um, uh, in Bayesian uh, in Bayesian neural networks in order to uh, improve the elbow estimates. So this is one reason why um, uh, why currently this approach fails in in deep neural networks, and this is one problem that we need to address. Now. There is recently this interesting paper by Florian Wenzortal, um, which said, okay, well, let's try and do the best possible uh, Bayesian infer inference that we can do in a neural network and uh, see if we can get better re results than point estimates. Um, so they spent a lot of time creating a, a, a kind of a Langevin dynamics uh, uh, Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo method um, to sample from the uh, posterior overweights of large neural networks. And um, um, they spent a lot of time evaluating these Markov chains to actually uh, try and confirm whether, they're, uh, whether they were working well in sampling from the right distribution. So confirming whether Markov chains actually sample from the right distribution generally is quite difficult. Um, and uh, so you can usually only prove that things are not working uh, but they didn't see any evidence that uh, uh, the Markov chain wasn't working. So I actually think that they probably did the best job that I've seen so far at actually um, approximating the posterior well enough. So from that point of view, I thought the paper was really impressive. Um, although what was annoying is that a different problem was actually uncovered. And they called this the cold posterior effect. So like I said, they did their best to do inference as well as they could, but then, that, then they found that um, predicting with the true posterior often yielded worse results than the baseline SQD. So this is really disheartening for people that want to make Bayesian inference uh, work in neural networks, because essentially, um, uh, if you end up spending loads of extra effort to approximate the posterior, you'd want uh, the performance to be better. And they actually found that the performance was worse. So um, what they investigated next was if they tempered the posterior, so they uh, made the posterior look more like a point estimate, they observed that they could actually get better performance in the SGD baseline. Um, so on the one hand, um, uh, that's positive, but it, because at least this extra effort uh, caused them to uh, get better results. But on the other hand, um, uh, if Bayesian inference was working correctly, you would uh, believe that the uh, true posterior would actually be the best performing method, not the, um, uh, not the tempered posterior. So um, this actually uncovers another problem that needs to be uh, addressed in Bayesian deep learning. Uh, and that's that we need to choose the right prior. So from a Bayesian perspective, if your posterior gives bad, uh, gives bad predictive performance, the only thing that you can really change um, is your prior assumptions in your model. And uh, what uh, the Wenzel paper showed was uh, that your, uh, the choices that people made in their priors um, could actually lead to degraded performance um, compared to SGD. So, um, yeah, uh, this is a, a kind of feature as well as a bug in Bayes that um, your uh, predictions are sensitive to your prior and um, therefore choosing the right prior is important to actually getting good uh, performance. So um, yeah, this led us to uh, do some um, uh, work on investigating whether um, priors in Bayesian deep neural networks could be improved as well. Um, so this is work that I did with uh, Vincent Fortein, Adria Griga, uh, Florian Wenzel, Gunnar Rech, uh, Rich Turner, uh, myself, and Lauren Aitchinson. So a nice big collaboration. Um, and originally we set out to investigate this called posterior effect uh, and uh, see if it could be reduced by uh, choosing uh, different priors. And we essentially investigated a whole bunch of priors by um, looking at the statistics of the weights that we got from uh, training with stochastic gradient descent. And we observed that these uh, posterior weights were often uh, more heavy tailed than the standard Gaussian priors, which would argue that perhaps we should use a heavy tailed prior. 
Um, for correlate, uh, for um, convolutional neural networks, we also noticed that within, uh, within uh, uh, filters, we observed uh, correlations uh, within uh, weights. So that motivated for a correlated weight prior. Now, what we actually observed were, was that um, at least when you use data augmentation, the, uh, the cold posterior effect wasn't removed. So we still, still saw that when we adjusted this temperature parameter, uh, we um, got better performance compared to SGD, but uh, without adjusting this temperature parameter, we didn't get better performance. So in that sense, uh, we didn't manage to uh, fix what we set out to do, which was to fix this cold posterior effect, uh, but we did uh, get better performance. So uh, this is also a slightly odd uh, result where um, uh, if you get improved performance with a different prior, that probably also shows that we fixed something that was wrong with the prior, um, even though we didn't fix uh, what we wanted to fix. But on the road to, um, to these results, we also noticed that uh, data augmentation was actually a large cause of the uh, cold posterior effect. Um, yes, so this work led to kind of more questions than answers in terms of getting Bayesian inference to really work in um, uh, neural networks, because essentially we observed that uh, we did get better performance with different uh, or highly correlated priors. Um, and we also observed that data augmentation was a, uh, a strong cause of the co cold posterior effect. But so far we didn't manage to get the best of both worlds, right? We want to have the performance of data augmentation uh, while also being able to do uh, accurate inference that actually improves the performance. Um, so this leaves us to, um, yeah, this essentially leaves us to have uh, still open questions that need to be resolved in Bayesian deep learning uh, with regards to what kind of prior we choose. Um, so there are possible explanations uh, for these effects, which inspire future uh, different priors that we might want to consider. So the correlated weights, the uh, success of correlated weights, um, has also been investigated in the context of infinitely wide neural networks. So um, Adria and I actually also had a paper at the uh, Approximate Inference Symposium recently, where we show that um, if you use independent weights in convolutional neural networks, you actually destroy the spatial correlation um, that convolutional neural networks are designed to have. Um, and that adding uh, these correlated weights back actually recover this uh, desirable property. So this might be an explanation for why correlated weights are good. Um, and the data augmentation issue with um, uh, 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 the data augmentation issue in the cold posterior effect might also be related to the fact that invariances should be um, expressed in the prior and not in the data set. So here we applied data augmentation in the usual way where we pretended that we had an expanded data set. Um, but in uh, the work on learning invariances uh, that I discussed earlier, um, we argue that the uh, invariance should be incorporated into the prior over the functions itself. Uh, so that might be another problem uh, with the current priors that we use that we have to uh, address uh, before we can make Bayesian inference truly work in deep neural networks. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I'll skip over this, except for saying that uh, there is currently one deep uh, uh, method that um, where uh, this kind of straightforward uh, uh, approach using variational inference does um, give you good uncertainty estimates that perform better than point estimates and usable um, uh, usable elbows, and that's deep Gaussian processes. So there is some evidence that we can make this work in deep structures, but um, for uh, doing this in deep neural networks, it seems like we still have uh, challenges in both prior specification and finding good approximations. Right, so to close off, um, I also wanted to uh, discuss a uh, final alternative approach to trying to do, uh, trying to approximate uh, densities over, over weights, uh, trying to approximate um, uh, posteriors over weights directly. And um, this is, uh, and yeah, so this alternative approach um, essentially tries to relate ensembles 
with architecture search. Um, so this is the third theme of my uh, recent research. And the core question that we ask uh, in this uh, uh, work is, is optimization in deep learning already doing some kind of architecture search? Or do we already get some kind of Occam's razor Bayesian uh, benefits uh, in the optimization procedures that uh, deep learning currently does? So if this is the case, then maybe uh, a kind of optimization deep learning approach um, is, is a more fruitful direction to look into rather than trying to fix all these problems um, with explicit Bayesian inf inference. So um, the key relationship that we investigated um, was the relationship between Bayesian inference and ensembles, because essentially ensembles uh, are models that are trained purely by optimization. Um, and they also get used to uh, uh, use uncertainty estimates. But we try to uh, investigate whether there were additional uh, relationships to the marginal likelihood, which could uh, um, argue that there are additional relationships to architecture search. Um, so we started uh, by investigating ensembling in linear models. And um, there's this really neat relationship between ensembles uh, and Gaussian and uh, Bayesian posteriors that exists for linear models, which is described in a very neat workshop paper by Alex Matthews et al. So what this workshop paper by Alex Matthews et al showed was that if you initialized your weights from your prior and then did gradient descent on your weights with respect to a, a non a regularized uh, squared loss, then the weights that you would end up with uh, so this is just a procedure that you would follow if you did ensembling. So the weights that you would end up with if you followed this ensembling procedure would be distributed exactly according to your weight posterior. So that was this little neat workshop paper uh, from 2017 that in my mind drew a strong relationship between uncertainty estimation in ensembling and um, and um, uh, uncertainty estimation from a Bayesian point of view uh, by estimating the posterior. So it essentially showed that ensemble, uh, ensembles of weights uh, were exactly equal to the posterior for linear models. So um, this is interesting because it highlights um, the similarity between optimization approaches and Bayesian approaches. Um, but one thing that's missing here to kind of make the, uh, the relationship to Bayesian inference really strong is an approximation of the marginal likelihood, which we would need in order to do uh, architecture search. So uh, together with uh, Claire Lyle, Lisa Schutt, uh, ben, uh, Robin Rue and uh, Yaren, we investigated this a bit further and um, found that actually you could come up with a, um, an estimate of the marginal likelihood for this model purely by considering the path that these weights would take during this gradient descent procedure. So for the details, I would refer to, uh, to the paper, but a long story short is that if you um, incrementally train these weights and add a new data point to this uh, objective function incrementally, and then measure the sum of the training loss for the next data point that you're about to add, then that is a lower bound to the marginal likelihood. So for linear models, the relationship between optimization and Bayesian model, uh, model selection is unambiguously, uh, is, is, is unambiguous, right? You get exact posterior samples from your minimization procedure, um, and you even get, uh, you get uh, lower bounds to your marginal likelihood, similarly that you would get from, um, uh, from uh, doing a variational lower bound. Now, this is, uh, just uh, linear models and these guarantees go away um, in nonlinear uh, models uh, like deep neural networks. Um, uh, but it does kind of show that in some limiting case at least, um, you, uh, there's this really strong relationship between optimization ways of training your models and uh, these Bayesian quantities. So specifically, um, there's also a relationship for infinitely wide deep neural networks because these behave like linear models and uh, you, you then recover these guarantees again, which I think is quite interesting. 
Um, so this was published in Europe last year. Um, so I'd refer to the paper um, if uh, you're interested. It's called A Bayesian Perspective on uh, Training Speed. Um, now, this relationship did make us uh, think, um, is there a way that we can use this, um, uh, this kind of sum over training losses or sum over predictive uh, losses for your next training point to come up with a good heuristic for architecture search? Uh, so this is empirical work, but uh, essentially by measuring the training speed in the way that, was, uh, that is um, uh, kind of inspired uh, by this training, um, uh, by this uh, estimator uh, for the marginal likelihood in linear models, we could come up with a, um, uh, uh, a kind of uh, metric that um, correlated with the future generalization error a lot better than um, the validation set in early uh, stages of training of a deep neural network. Now, um, so essentially this uh, cheap metric allowed us to predict whether a neural network would um, would generalize well in the early stages of training. Um, so this is a cheap heuristic that we don't actually have any, uh, any guarantees about, but it is something that we could empirically study, and we saw this uh, large correlation. And uh, a good predictor of uh, generalization performance is really important to speed up uh, neural architecture search. Because um, the earlier you can tell whether a neural network uh, is going to generalize well, uh, the less computation you need to spend in um, actually optimizing it. So with uh, the same group of people, we um, uh, embedded this into uh, kind of standard neural architecture search uh, uh, procedures and saw that this um, metric, which was inspired by um, the marginal likelihood for linear models, uh, we could see that we could uh, speed up the um, neural architecture, architecture search, sometimes quite considerably. So, um, yeah, this was a rather whistle-stop tour of these three different themes uh, that I've been thinking about in my research recently, all the way from um, model selection in cases that we actually have quite good guarantees for, so uh, linear models or uh, Bayesian inference over the last uh, layer of a, of a deep neural network, um, to trying to solve the problems that uh, we have with uh, Bayesian inference in uh, deep learning for uh, full uh, neural networks to kind of uh, more deep learning style empirical approaches uh, to try and get these ideas to actually work at scale. So uh, yeah, to conclude, um, I hope uh, you would uh, agree that Bayesian model selection could provide great benefits in deep neural networks if we can uh, use this uh, to make Bayesian, um, to, to, to make model selection in deep neural networks easier, then that would um, greatly simplify things. Um, I hope that I've also showed that inference and prior specification are unsolved problems uh, in deep neural networks and that solving them would allow us to use this very elegant procedure that we could uh, use for Gaussian processes. Um, also that, um, uh, yeah, so I briefly mentioned that there are examples where this marginal likelihood approach does actually work for deep models, so deep Gaussian processes, but for deep neural networks it's still an open problem. Um, and that uh, we need to work on ways forward, right? So perhaps we still need uh, better approximations uh, uh, to posteriors to get this um, gap in the elbow smaller. Um, perhaps we need to investigate model misspecification in weight priors. Um, and uh, perhaps um, all of these uh, Bayesian methods can inspire mechanisms that can help us do the same thing, but in a very different way like we investigated uh, with uh, in this final part of the talk. So um, all in all, thanks very much uh, for your attention. Um, and I would be happy to discuss any questions if there are any. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, very inspiring and nice presentation. Um, so uh, I would like to ask uh, the audience if they have questions to better write them in the chat box and I will read them. Otherwise, uh, we're too many people to uh, make it otherwise. Um, so quite a few people compliment you for your presentation skills. So that's good. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, a few questions. Uh, I guess you can uh, read them in the chat box, but I, maybe I can, it's better if I uh, read them to you. 
so uh, by Thais M. Uh, thanks, Mark. Great talk. Must have been a lot of head scratching. Has it crossed your mind to abandon the idea of separate prior and posterior estimation? Um, yes, uh, it keeps me up at night. Um, so uh, neural processes are a kind of cool way um, to uh, kind of fuse the specification of priors. So it learns kind of a prior and an inference procedure at the same time. Um, but the cost is uh, having to um, uh, having to um, learn from many example data sets. You have to take a kind of meta-learning approach. Um, yeah, I even had a bit of a slide on this. That's the next slide. So um, yeah, so uh, meta-learning is kind of one uh, possible paradigm that could completely replace this uh, this kind of approach, but it comes at a cost, right? So meta learning requires uh, can help you find inductive biases, but it requires many example data sets uh, for you to learn uh, what your inductive bias uh, bias should be from. So the cool thing about this approach for specifying your prior and then trying to do Bayesian inference is that from a single data set uh, you can figure out what the right inductive bias is. So yeah, there are trade offs here and um, yeah, what is the one that is ultimately going to be scalable? I really don't know. And you know, this is uh, something that research will 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 uh, shed some more light on. Uh, but I do think uh, that the Bayesian approach with a separate prior and posterior has certain nice properties, right? The fact that you can find the inductive bias on a single data set, I think is a pretty uh, amazing thing. Uh, yes, very nice, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, the next question is, um, <clears throat> let me see, there's a long one. Uh, amazing presentation skills for a very complex topic, <laughs> well done. Uh, first question is, in the example where you only train the last layer, where are the first layers pre-trained? Or uh, randomly instantiated like the first layer of an extreme learning machine? Yeah, great question. Um, so, I mentioned briefly that you had to have this coordinate ascent style training scheme. Um, so that effectively does pre-training. So you do pre-training of your uh, of your um, uh, weights, and then you um, uh, learn your Gaussian process on top, and you learn the invariance parameters with that, keeping your neural network fixed, and then you update the neural network given those new um, uh, those new invariance parameters. Um, I am not happy with this. Uh, this is yeah. a pain, <laughs> um, and but currently we're. I actually think that we're really bad at optimizing Gaussian process models, even in the last layer, uh, just because there hasn't been this huge community like inventing optimizers to, to do a good job at, um, uh, at making this opt uh, optimization quicker. So I hope to be able to solve this. And actually I'm working together with a master's student who's um, made some incredible leaps and bounds at optimizing Gaussian process models quickly. So I hope that this problem will be fixed in the future. Great. So the second question by the same uh, by, by Nikos is uh, for the case where, uh, where where you manage to backpropagate onto the hyperparameter space, uh, can you estimate how many trainable parameters you will have compared to a traditional CNN, or intuition, or can you give an intuition on how more complex the loss manifold will get, making it harder to find a minimum? Yes. Okay. So maybe it can it can help if I give a little bit more context on the training procedure. So the, the, um, the unified elbow that depends on both the variational parameters and the hyperparameters. Um, so, the, uh, so, how, so firstly, how many parameters do we need to optimize there? Well, firstly, the, the hyperparameters, and those are only a small number of them, right? So currently we considered um, a, a set of transformations that described our invariance. And um, essentially we asked the, the hyperparameters determined how much of certain pre-specified invariances we add. So we considered affine transformations and also kind of local deformations, which had a little vector field that, um, that deformed the MNIST image a bit. Um, so the framework is quite general, but the set of invariances that we considered was a bit more limited. And these hyperparameters just determined how much of these invariances we, add, we added. So I think we had maybe 15 parameters that determined the invariance. Um, mm -hmm. The number of parameters for the uh, for the actual function approximation that is on the order of the number of parameters. Like think about it as the weights of your network, um, and that's what you learn a distribution over. So you represent your uncertainty over that. I hope that answers your question. 
Well, I hope so too. <laughs> uh, okay, so the, there is one more question that it's also, yeah, I also had it a bit. So how are you trained actually, how do you actually train your inductive bias parameter? So um, uh, by inductive bias, it, you, know, you can have like your invariances, but uh, you also mentioned layers and, uh, and whatnot. Do you actually also train uh, these hyperparameters? Um, so things like how many layers do we have? Yeah. Um, yeah, so one thing that I, um, I think that there, uh, yeah, so I, I guess my research so far has focused on the objective function for selecting hyperparameters with, and there are still open problems with that. But mm -hmm. the value of having an objective function is kind of, um, is, is limited or expanded by how many parameters you can uh, differentiably uh, uh, train with respect to. So um, yeah, layers is a discrete choice and that's obviously a, a difficulty, but perhaps um, ideas of uh, like neural ODEs where um, a layer is kind of considered as an infinitesimal thing and you uh, consider how long you just propagate through that ODE, um, maybe this would be a way to make it more differentiable. Um, right. Similarly, um, with invariances, I think there's been a lot of work uh, from people uh, also from uh, this group here in thinking about how to parameterize invariances. Uh -huh. uh, and I follow this work with um, uh, great interest and uh, a lot of admiration. Um, and I think the, I guess the next step that I would like to see would be a continuous parameterization uh, of right. different invariances rather than kind mm -hmm. of discrete mm -hmm. choices. Right, right. Um, so there is one more question. Uh, yeah, by the way, I would also like that. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with a paper Bayesian optimization with robust Bayesian neural networks by Spriggenberg and others? Uh, they used adaptive uh, SGHM to do Bayesian optimization, perhaps doing uh, any sort of adaptive stochastic rate Bayesian based sampling uh, can help. What do you think? Um, yeah, so SGHMC, I assume, Stochastic Gradient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, uh, yeah, it's just SGHM in the textbook, so I can only assume yes, but. Okay, okay. Um, yes. So, right. um, yes, uh, I am vaguely familiar with, uh, I'm familiar with the, with the uh, approach, but uh, vaguely familiar with that uh, paper. Um, I see many ways forward in doing better inference in deep neural networks. And sampling, um, sampling is definitely one of them. The challenge is with uh, approaches like um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is that you don't get an, you don't get an estimate of the um, of the elbow out of those sampling methods. So that's one nice thing about variational inference. Um, however, there are ways there are sampling techniques that give you estimates of the marginal likelihoods. Um, yes, so. Many things to be explored there, I think, is maybe where I should leave that. Right, I see. So I also have a question. I think I'm. Uh, uh, there are no more questions. If there are more questions by people, let, let, uh, let me know. Uh, my question is, uh, so an application of Bayesian learning uh, or Bayesian deep learning, I guess, would be active learning. Um, uh, I haven't really seen any killer paper out there, but maybe I, I just haven't seen it. and uh, It's my fault. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what you presented today is also a bit worrying in the sense that there seems to be no good Bayesian deep learning model uh, yet. Does this mean that uh, we cannot have good active learning uh, or that we should do something heuristic and uh, ad hoc and that's already good enough? Yeah, okay, well, um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna choose to, okay, so maybe I, I was a little bit pessimistic in, in the middle part of my talk when I said about all the things that I think are wrong with Bayesian deep learning. Mm -hmm. um, people have published papers on active learning and Bayesian deep learning using the uncertainty estimates and, and they've shown improvements um, all the way from kind of simple application of, of dropout even. Uh, people have done uh, active learning. Now I think you're right that there hasn't been a kind of killer application and um, yeah one might wonder whether that's the case because active learning is held back by the quality of the uncertainty estimates. Now, um, I actually consider the fact that uh, there are reasons to believe that 
Bayesian deep learning currently doesn't work very well as a reason to be optimistic. Because if Bayesian, if, if we were already doing the best that we possibly can in <laughs> estimating uh, post posteriors overweights and we weren't doing very well, you know, then I would, I would probably stop working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, given the fact that there's evidence that we can still do way better, um, I, I think that's my reason to be optimistic that actually we can um, do much better in these applications in the future. If right, no, no, that, that's, uh, right, that's very perfectly, of course. Uh, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, the best questions are the ones that are not answered yet or are not easily answered. Um, great. Um, there are no more questions, so uh, I, uh, maybe it makes sense we stop here so that you also get some rest. I know that uh, online presentations can be exhausting. So um, thank you very, very much again uh, for the honor. It was a great talk. And uh, I hope that uh, at some point we can also see each other face to face. Let us know if uh, you, know, you drop by Amsterdam, uh, let me know. Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I do actually drop by Amsterdam quite a lot. I'm, I'm actually okay. Dutch myself, so uh, yeah. I go back uh, to Holland often. I, <laughs> the, the, name, the name gives it away. <laughs> exactly. Thanks very much uh, okay, for the opportunity. Great. It was great to speak. Definitely, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you uh, very much to everyone for attending this talk. Uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.